What's going on, Imperials? It's Emperor Cubone here. There are hundreds of Pokémon out there. Some of them are pretty much universally beloved by the fans, while others are not so desired. However, some Pokémon, despite being pretty solid, just spend their lives being compared to others, whether fairly or not, leading to many good Pokémon being lost in the shadow of others. So, here are the top six most overshadowed Pokémon. Number 6, Togedemaru. Honestly, I forget about this metallic hedgehog a lot. People ask about the Magnezone line being a unique typing, and I know that there's something there, but I can't always place this little spike ball immediately. After several generations of Pikachu clones, you've got to do something to stand out. And while Togedemaru does have a good typing, and some pretty good abilities and such, it still doesn't set itself apart much from the rest of the electric rodents. But that's not even the biggest problem. Togedemaru has to contend with something that no other Pikachu clone does. Competition. Instead of simply being the latest in a long line of largely the same, the Alola region gave us our standard Pikachu clone, but also gave us a pretender. Mimikyu is rather Pikachu-like on purpose, but when it was revealed, fans went nuts over this thing. Mimikyu has a tragic backstory, with which many fans either sympathized or identified, and so its popularity skyrocketed even before release. Now, this is good for Mimikyu's PR, but apparently there's only so much attention to go around, because Mimikyu effectively eclipsed Togedemaru for many fans. Even the games themselves make it difficult, by putting them right next to each other in the decks. Also, you can only catch Togedemaru rarely in an easily missed side area, while prominently featuring Mimikyu as a totem trial. Now, they did include Totem Togedemaru in the second games, but that seems more like a consolation prize, and being a year later was too late to make a difference, since Mimikyu's prominence was all but concrete at that point. And it's even worse if you haven't been watching the anime recently, like me, so you aren't inundated with Sophocles' partner all the time. But even then, you have Jesse's Mimikyu that's there just as often. So even in other mediums, it has to compete. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this Steel-type Pikachu clone, especially in battle. But unfortunately, it just gets out-marketed in its chosen slot by another creature that isn't even in the running. Number 5, Embor. In Generation 3, we got an amazing trio of starters that, to me, is probably the most evenly distributed in terms of great design meeting capable playability. Notably, we got a giant chicken, which seems like it would be a joke, but Blaziken pulls off its firefighting type combination beautifully, with lots of dual stab to fell many a foe. Move over to the next gen, and we got Infernape, who, somewhat surprisingly, had the same combination with Fire and Fighting. But that was okay since the setup really benefited from the game in which it was found. And despite not being a personal favorite of mine, Infernape captured the hearts of many fans out there, becoming a favorite. But the fact that it was a good choice and competitive, and one of the only practical fire types for the whole Sinnoh region, didn't hurt. Then we had 5th Gen, and before the games even came out, there were memes about having anything different for a Fire-type starter. And when we saw cute little Tepig, there was hope, but those were soon dashed by Pig Knight and then Imbor. Being the third firefighting in as many generations was more than enough reason for some people to write off this strapping swine. And I think the fact that the other two starters were pure-typed in their final stages also rubbed some people the wrong way disrupting what otherwise could have been a monotype starter trio, which so far has only occurred in the Johto region. But just because Imbor's typing is a little redundant doesn't mean it's terrible. In fact, it can actually be just as good in battle as its predecessors. It actually has the highest individual attack and HP stat of all fully evolved starters, and it learns all sorts of fantastic coverage moves. Imbor can learn Scald! And it is the only fire type able to do so besides Volcanion, who's part water type anyway. That is seriously impressive for a Pokemon that many disregarded as a mere ripoff of those that came before. 
and it says to me that Imbor is far more than just another firefighting type. Number 4. Whiskash A common way that Pokémon are analyzed is by using their types. It's very easy to draw mental comparisons between Pokémon that share all the same strengths and weaknesses, especially if the combination is somewhat rare. So that's where our buddy Whiskash comes in. Barboach and Whiskash were interesting little mudfish to come out in the Hoenn region, and they were blessed with one of the best types in the franchise, with water and ground. These two elements combining lends to multiple resistances, with only one times four weakness to grass. So what's the problem? Well, this exquisite type pairing was already done before with Wooper and Quagsire, and then the market got diluted a little bit in subsequent generations with the likes of Gastrodon and Seismitoad. But these peripheral Pokémon sharing its typing is not even Whiskash's biggest problem. That distinction goes to the giant starter-shaped hole in the roster. Swampert being the water-type starter for Hoenn region meant that the poor Whiskash line never stood a chance of standing out from the crowd. Seriously, not only is Swampert incredibly powerful in combat and useful for general gameplay, but to this day, it has the highest base stat total of any non-Mega starter. And when it does Mega, it still beats the rest in raw strength. I mean, how could it not with all of the steroids that it's clearly taking? Whiskash, I'm sure, wasn't even on the short list for Megas, so there was no hope of a resurgence for this fish that's actually a lot tinier than you'd expect which is a real shame because it's a solid Pokémon in its own right. It has great coverage moves backed by decent stats across the board. Even the water-based Team Aqua never bothered to touch this thing, even though it would have severely helped them out, while at the same time boosting Whiskash's relevance overall. If you've never tried to use one of these Pokémon, I would suggest checking out this well-built creature with only one weakness. Because as it stands, Whiskash doesn't deserve to be buried down in the mud by the rest of the Water Ground Club, and be particularly overshadowed just because it was unlucky enough to share its setup with a starter. Number 3. Rotom Now you might be thinking, how could Rotom possibly be overshadowed? But by looking at the only Electric and Ghost-type Pokémon, we can see that it is in the unique position of being overshadowed by itself. Rotom had its own special encounter in a haunted house, which was nice, but it soon underwent big changes by adding a bunch of different forms that it could change into by merging with various appliances. These forms get different typings and unique moves, and once they came out, people took to using them in the competitive scene in all sorts of manners. But this was largely to the detriment of the original. Once people figured out these aberrations could be exploited, the original Rotom form was all but ignored. And even now, Rotom has received other new forms, such as the Rotom Dex that is used in Alola, and even a new Rotom phone or drone in the Gala region. But these are still just Rotom possessing other things. Nobody seems to want Rotom in its regular form, which is too bad. At least people appreciate Ditto for its breeding capabilities instead of just turning into other things. But Rotom is almost exclusively desired for its ability to turn into anything else, including some sort of PC for the newest games. But nobody seems to care about good old classic Rotom by itself anymore, even though it's a pretty fine Pokémon with a great unique typing. And truthfully, its original state is even better than some of the alternative forms. It's okay, Rotom. I don't want you just to trick out my other technology. Number 2. Porygon Z Usually a good way to overshadow a Pokémon is to give it an evolution, mostly if that occurs later on so that everyone drops the original in favor of the shiny new toy. And this might have been the case for Porygon Z as well. I don't really remember. I don't think I was able to get one until sometime after Generation 5 came out. But, coincidentally, Gen 5 is when things started to go downhill for our dubiously downloaded friend. All of Porygon Z's woes can be summed up in one word. Eviolite. Eviolite is a fantastic item that allows unevolved Pokémon to get boosted in their defenses, so that they can be more usable in combat. This is great for Little Cup, or if you just happen to like the pre-evolved forms better. 
and this item is pretty much the solitary reason why Shuckle will never, ever get an evolution. But with such power-ups, some Pokémon saw a massive increase in usefulness. And while sometimes it can benefit both, such as the case in making both Gliscor and Gligar viable in battle, sometimes it made things a little bit more imbalanced, like with the Porygon line. Porygon 2 was perfectly fine, but once it could get Eviolite, suddenly this CG rubber ducky was a tank that could sit and wall opponents for days. Porygon 2 became one of the premier stall Pokémon in existence, able to toxic or thunder wave everything, shooting off random coverage moves, and then, just when you think you might get it to die, it spams recover. One simple item made Porygon 2 into a competitive favorite over its evolved state. But even if Porygon Z isn't quite as bulky, it still has a scary high special attack that it can put to good use with one of the most diverse move pools out there. Of course, its previous evolutions also share in this and can use the Eviolite Wonder Pill. Maybe one day they could make some kind of hold item specifically for Porygon Z, so that it could get back to its rightful place as the strongest one in the family. Number 1. Raichu You might have expected this, or it may not have even occurred to you, but there is no doubt that the franchise mascot Pikachu is far and above the most prominently publicized Pokémon in existence. Pikachu is not only on all of the merchandise, but it's also the hero of the anime, further cementing it as a favorite for kids everywhere. But if you were wondering about its evolution, don't worry, Raichu is portrayed as an outright villain with Lieutenant Surge in the Vermilion City Gym, and again in the first movie short. Man, Raichu really needs a better publicist. And it's not like it gets better, since in the next generation, they gave us Pichu. Meaning if anybody did want something different than the standard Pikachu, they'd probably go for the smaller, cuter baby form as their favorite over the boring adult one with the giant clown feet. Sorry, just talking about it makes you start to put Raichu down when it's really not that bad. Raichu has good power and speed while only having one weakness, so it's not exactly a pushover in combat. The only huge drawback is a somewhat limited move pool, but the entire line suffers from that. Now they did create a new Alolan form for Raichu, giving it a unique second typing and ability. However, this only further overshadowed the original form. Nowadays, if most people bothered picking a Raichu, then they'll use the Psychic Surfer. And I'm guilty of this too. I used an Alolan Raichu before I ever even considered using the original. And the salt in the wound is that the regional variant is all based entirely on other Pikachu. The serving one in the line has always been Pikachu. Even the psychic powers come from a Pikachu that's old enough to have wrinkles. Meaning that they would rather die having lower base stats than turning into a dreaded Raichu. Which just doesn't seem fair. And it's not an isolated case, because the Pokemon franchise is littered with Pikachu that can never evolve because becoming a Raichu seems to be just about the worst fate the creators of Pokémon could imagine, when in actuality, this is a perfectly respectable Pokémon that just so happened to have the misfortune of coming after the mascot of the entire franchise, forced to live in its shadow forever. Hopefully one day this Pokémon can get over the poor hand it's been dealt and be able to stand with its pre-evolution as equals. So, those are the top 6 overshadowed Pokémon. Which great Pokémon do you wish had better exposure? Let me know down in the comments. Also be sure to leave a like, share this video, and subscribe so that you too can become an Imperial today. And we'll see you around next time!